is a pleasure to be with you today. My name is Julian Birkinshaw. I'm a professor of strategy and entrepreneurship at the London Business School. And I'm going to be talking to you today about building organizational resilience. And let me just start by asking you what you think the future will bring. What will be the things happening in the years ahead? And Donald Rumsfeld, the former uh, Department of Defense Secretary at the, in the US, came up with this notion that as we look into the future, we have to separate out known unknowns from unknown unknowns. And what he meant by that, of course, was that there are some risks that the US faces in terms of, for example, terrorist attacks, where we know something about the, the risk, but we don't know when it will happen, or we don't know what exact form it will take. But then there are the unknown unknowns, the things where we can't even begin to get our heads around where the risk lies. And of course, the unknown unknowns are far more dangerous because you just don't know how to analyze them. And if we take that very simple split between known unknowns and unknown unknowns into the business context for ourselves, we've got exactly the same thing going on. On the one hand, we have a whole set of risks that we deal with in business on an everyday basis, from accidents to fire, to bad weather, to risks of particular suppliers, defaulting currency or whatever. These are the sort of risks that we generally put insurance policies into play to secure us against. We can take out insurance on all of those things on that list. And that is a way of mitigating the downside. We actually have very little financial penalty to pay when those things happen. But there are, of course, huge numbers of potential risks that are unknown unknowns. And obviously, in the last 20 years, there have been three huge ones, the 9-11 attacks in New York, the global financial crisis and COVID-19 that we are living through today. And then those have been kind of global in scope. And there have been huge regional ones. If you just look at those three images there, you'll recognize BP's Deepwater Horizon explosion in the Gulf of Mexico. You'll recognize the Icelandic volcano Eyjafjallajökull, Yoko, which exploded over European airspace, grounding all flights in 2012. And then you've got more recently the Fukushima nuclear accident in Japan. And, and my point here is not that these were unforeseeable conceptually. In other words, you know, all sorts of companies have indeed had sort of scenarios in their mind about possible pandemics and financial crises and nuclear attacks. But my point is that for general companies, operating in retail or in uh, manufacturing or whatever, they will not have built plans to cater to all of these different possible unknown unknowns. You know, if you're British Petroleum, you've absolutely planned for the risks of, uh, you know, your, your wealth going on fire. But for the companies that are in the supply chain uh, of other organizations in the Gulf of Mexico, it's very unlikely that they would have actually thought through the consequences of that. So my point is, as a business person, as a general business person, trying to make sense of the business world, the operating environment, you have to come to a slightly more thoughtful way of looking at the future. And unfortunately, we typically don't do a good job of that. If I asked you to, to show me your business plan, and I've written these business plans myself, you know, what you generally do is you come up with a, a, a plan which says we're going to grow our top lines or our profit by five or ten percent a year for the next five or ten years. And then we're going to put a bit of sensitivity analysis around that plan just to prove that we thought a little bit about what you know, good might look like, what bad might look like. And of course, the trouble is that those plans uh, are beautiful. They're very attractive. They, they suggest a certain level of clarity about what we're doing, but they're also dead wrong. And they're dead wrong for the simple reason that we don't actually factor in the unknown unknowns, the unforeseeable ups and downs that really afflict us. Because if we actually take a look at how things work in practice, and we think about both the sudden death threats, the things which are potentially hugely disruptive to our business, and then the what you might call golden opportunities, the upside opportunities that come along every now and then, it's very clear that these things happen in spiky, unpredictable ways. We've got a vague sense that some of these opportunities and threats might come along, but we've no idea when. And that, of course, means that our way of looking at the business world 
has to be thought through a little bit differently. And so for those of us who are in the role of trying to plan for the future uh, and think through consequences and ramifications of these golden opportunities and these southern death threats, we have to develop a new set of plans. And of course, these plans are just even more important today than they ever were before. And I want us to just spec, uh, sort of, you know, contemplate two different metaphors. We've, we've used the metaphor of agility a great deal over the last 10 or 20 years. This is just the simple notion that an agile organization is one that can move quickly and easily to adapt to opportunities as they arise. And of course, agile has also become this very specific methodology that started out in the world of software development and has found its way into many, many other parts of the business world. So agility is important, but there's an equally important concept of resilience that sometimes gets a little bit lost in the conversation. If agility is the capacity to adapt to opportunity, for me, resilience is the capacity to withstand or to sort of jump back when faced with adversity. And so resilience is almost all around managing the downside. And you see in those two images there, you see the tree on the right trying to continue to grow, even though there doesn't seem to be anywhere for its roots to go. And the bottom left, you can see an image just a, it's just an image of accident emergency uh, services responding when a town is flooded. Uh, and the, the point of that little image is to say that, in fact, the human system, the human sort of society is actually very resilient. We're actually very good at bouncing back from these sorts of of downturns. So we want to build more resilience into our system. We want to make sure that we continue to be agile. And let me just play out in a little bit more detail the difference between agility and resilience in a particular business setting. And this is the banking crisis of 2008 to 10. You will all remember that period of crisis. What you see on that image there is the Dow Jones index collapsing uh, in September 2008 and really taking many, many years before it actually got back to where it had been before that. And if you remember that period, looking at the banks specifically, you know, the really uh, impressive, exciting places to work in that era were the so-called broker dealers. This was Goldman Sachs, Merrill Lynch, Morgan Stanley, Lehman Brothers, Bear Stearns. And they were agile. They were supremely fast moving. They were very good at taking measured risks. They were very good at identifying the big, exciting opportunities and throwing their weight behind them. But as soon as the crisis hit, the Goldman Sachs and the Merrill Lynch category of banks found themselves in deep trouble. If you remember, of course, Bear Stearns had to actually be bought out. Uh, they were essentially sold. Uh, and then you had, of course, Lehman Brothers in September 2008, which went bankrupt. And that was, of course, the thing that really precipitated the crisis. And the reason, of course, that these broker dealers became troubled, troubled was because, of course, they, they didn't have the strength of balance sheets. They didn't have huge amounts of deposits from regular you know, lenders of money on their balance sheets. And of course, they weren't as heavily government regulated either. And so what happened in very short order, you may well remember this, is that Lehman went bankrupt, Bear Stearns was sold, um, Merrill Lynch was actually sold to Bank of America, and the last two surviving broker dealers, Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley, actually converted themselves into what we call bank holding companies. Big bank holding companies like Citibank, like Chase Manhattan, which became JP Morgan Chase. These were traditional bank holding companies which had all the deposits from their lenders and were, of course, hugely resilient. They just were able to withstand a crisis in the way that the supremely agile brokers and dealers were not. So to finish the story, hopefully it's very clear what I'm saying. Agility is great when times are tough, but when times are bad, agility is not enough. You've actually got to be resilient. You've got to have a sufficient capacity within your operation to withstand those downturns. And so, of course, what I'm going to do over the next uh, 20, 30 minutes is play out some of the aspects of what resilience really looks like. And let me play out three levels of resilience. On the one hand, you have operational resilience at the core, just literally the ability to keep your operations going when a downturn hits. 
But we've got two other forms of resilience we've got to be thoughtful about as well. On the top, we, we have what I think of as strategic resilience, which essentially means not just that we can be resilient in today's operations, but that we've actually developed a point of view on the future that allows our strategy, the basic choices we make around the products and markets we sell into, that make sure that strategy is itself resilient to changing needs, that allows us to monitor and respond to trends in the marketplace that are not obvious today. And then at the bottom, we have what I'm thinking of as personal resilience, which is really about individual employees and indeed leaders, their individual capacity to withstand shocks, to, to maintain a sense of capability through a period of downturn. And of course, all of these are important in the round. I'm going to spend five minutes talking about strategic resilience, and then I'm going to switch over to talk about operational and personal resilience together. So strategic resilience, what is, what is that? It is, as I say, it is the capacity of an organization to maintain its functioning over time as the world changes in fundamental ways. And we used to have this rather simplistic view that you could develop strategy in the same way that a grandmaster develops their, their, their playing strategy in a game of chess. We can look several steps ahead. We can plot the position of our play, our, our, our pawns and our queens and our rooks on the game board, and we can beat the opposition. And we get competitive advantage when we beat the opposition. All well and good, but actually not really a very functional way of thinking about the world strategy today. I actually like to think of strategy today as coping with the fog of the future. I, I stole that term from a, a former colleague, Professor Don Sull at MIT. And, and Don came up with this beautiful metaphor, which is that you are driving down a highway in fog, in dense fog. And of course, if you're doing that, you're driving a little bit more slowly anyway, but you're particularly sensitive to the risk that, for example, a large truck will suddenly appear in front of you and that you'll have to swerve to avoid it. And so we can't foresee the future. We can see a little bit of the future, but we can't see a long way into the future. And we've just got to be hugely adaptive when those sort of circumstances arise, when we've got to move quickly. So how do we cope with the fog of the future? I'm going to suggest three frameworks, three, three strategies, if you want to call it that, each of which have got its challenges, but are actually more useful, I think, than using classical notions of five forces, structural analysis, or, or whatever your preferred approaches to strategy used to be. So number one, to cope with the fog of the future is, is a concept of active waiting. And let me just tell you a sort of a 60 second version of a classical story a story of two beer companies in Brazil, in the largest country in South America, in the 1990s. Uh, Antarctica on the left, Brahma on the right. In 1990, Antarctica was far and away the most successful beer brand in Brazil. And by 1999, Brahma had taken that position away from Antarctica. And they'd done it by creating an incredibly efficiently run high quality manufacturing and distribution machine built on a set of organizational principles which were all about efficiency and cost reduction. And they were so successful that in 1999, when the Brazilian real, the currency, was devalued about 66% against the dollar, Brahma was much better positioned. It had hedged against that possible exposure and it had a much more efficient operation. Than, than Antarctica. It was in a position, Brown was in a position to actually buy Antarctica for almost nothing and to create the company that we now know today as AB InBev. So the origins of today's AB InBev, the biggest beer company in the world by a long margin, actually came out of this beer war in Brazil in the 1990s. Now that's a fascinating little story, uh, but it actually exemplifies very nicely the principle that Don Sol came up with, which is what he called active waiting. He said, you know, if you are a company operating in the turbulent environment of Brazil in the 1990s, you can't afford just to be agile. You've actually got to build huge financial strength. You've got to run a tight ship. You've got to have really efficient 
production facilities so that you've got a lower cost of production than anyone else. And then you are ready to move extremely quickly. And this notion of active waiting and being in a position to grab opportunities when they arise is a very, very different approach than the traditional logic of strategy making. So that's the first model. The other two I'm going to talk about fairly quickly. They're quite well known. Each has got its own limitations. The second we call scenario planning. It is simply this notion that even though we can't foresee the future, we can actually plot out a number of possible scenarios for what that future might look like so that regardless of which scenario actually ends up happening, we are a little bit better prepared. It's really about building your basic capabilities to cope with whichever scenario comes your way. Scenario planning emerged from the oil industry in the late 60s and early 70s. Arguably, it helped Shell, the company that created the, the technique, uh, to cope better with the oil shock of 1973 than its competitors. And this is a methodology that's now used all the time in the business world. And on the right-hand side there, you can see one scenario plan that's just been put in place just in the last two or three months about the, the implications of the pandemic for different types of business scenarios. Now, I'm not gonna take you through that story. The, the key point I just want to underline here is that drawing up a scenario or a set of scenarios about the future is actually quite easy. Anybody can say, you know, we don't know, for example, what the response of the public will be to a pandemic. Will it be panicked? Will it be disciplined? Anybody can do this scenario planning. The real trick with scenario planning is to take those ideas and to then use them as a proper input to your resource allocation process. What are we putting our resources into? In other words, if we think there's a, a viable scenario where you know, the world actually does have a pandemic and there is a huge crisis, have we put enough resources into coping with that scenario? Or have we continued to put all of our resources into the traditional sort of strength? Which leads me to the third concept, strategic concept, which is the concept of real options, which again, is vital in today's unpredictable world. Uh, a real option is nothing more than the right, not the obligation, the right to essentially capitalize on investment that we have made, a small investment. A real option basically says we've made a small amount of investment in something because it might be important, because the scenarios tell us that. And that allows us to have a foothold so that we can then build on that depending on how the world works out. And let me just give you a very um, interesting example of real options thinking in practice. It is the classic tale of Kodak and Fujifilm. You all know what happened to Kodak in the early 2000s. Maybe you're less familiar with what happened to Fujifilm in the 2000s, which is that actually it survived the death of traditional film-based imaging quite nicely. And the roots of the difference in outcome for Fuji and Kodak goes back to the basic chemical business that lies underneath the film industry. Both Kodak and Fuji had chemical businesses in the 90s. Kodak sold its chemical business, it was called Eastman Chemicals, in 1995. Fuji retained its chemical business and it used that chemical business as we were coming out of the 90s and into the 2000s to diversify into a number of related areas. So Fuji, for example, created a whole line of cosmetics products built on its chemical business. Fuji nowadays is even in the world of pharmaceutical drug development. It's even coming up with a drug, I believe, to potentially help us with COVID-19. So my point is, Fuji has diversified because it maintained a real option through its chemical business in a number of related areas, whereas Kodak did not. Kodak put all the eggs in one basket and that basket broke. So real options thinking, by the way, is no panacea. I mean, at some point you've got to make decisions about what do I do with that option? To what, when do I decide to really turn that possibility into a huge commitment to the future? That's the real challenge. So, let me now move to the second part of my talk, which is all about the principles of organizing that 
are underpinning operational and personal resilience. And the way I'm going to do that is by identifying four um, elements, if you like, of a traditional organization, a traditional, more hierarchical, bureaucratic, industrial organization, to an alternative organizational model, a more fluid one, one that's perhaps more suited to today's fast moving and uncertain world. And I'm just going to take you through each of these four in turn. So point number one, to, to, to the switch from bureaucracy to emergence. If you think about it, bureaucracy is by definition fairly rigid, fairly internally focused. It's all about essentially coordinating activities through standardized rules and procedures. What is an emergent way of coordinating? It is a fluid one that essentially puts resources to the right places more quickly and efficiently. And of course, there's nothing inherently wrong with bureaucracy, but in an uncertain world, we need more emergence. Let me just give you a very specific way of getting your head around what I mean by this. Go back to 2005 uh, and Hurricane Katrina, which you may well remember, devastated large parts of the Southern US, particularly the city of New Orleans. And that particular disaster was actually responded to quite slowly by the US emergency agency called FEMA, F-E-M-A. Um, and, and for various reasons, FEMA was slow to respond, whereas Walmart, the big retailer, was incredibly quick to respond. Walmart actually got all of its local Walmart managers taking their own initiative to respond with all Walmart's you know, available skills and capacity and, and inventory to help the people of New Orleans. And the quote you see on your screen there from the chief executive at the time was, look, I want you guys to make decisions, make the best decisions you can with the information available and just do the right thing. In other words, he allowed local responsiveness as a much more rapid way of getting your head around how to make a crisis right. And if you think about it, that's the exact principle of emergence in a nutshell. And if you play that out in terms of the current crisis, it actually gives us a very, very useful insight into what a country or a subregion of a country has to do to manage in a crisis. We absolutely need the initial response to be from the people closest to the problem because they are simply more able to act. They see what the problem is and they have the capacity to act. But actually, in the medium term, in order to have a fully joined up response, we need the top to intervene. So we actually need the, the process to go from top bottom, bottom up in the first instance to top down in the second instance. And that's really the essence of emergence in a nutshell. The second principle, and this is a much more individual or personal aspect of the same, of the same system, which is the shift from formalization, essentially doing a job through standardized formal rules around accountability to personalization, where I am taking individual responsibility for my actions. And again, it's very useful to think of an example to understand exactly what is going on here. When you ask yourself what caused the financial crisis of 2008, I've already talked a little bit about it. And you go, so you say, so say to yourself, what, what was at the heart of the problem? Why was it that the banks and the rating agencies and the government agencies allowed the system to fail as badly as it is? And essentially for us to create products which were servicing you know, homes where the individuals who were buying those homes simply did not have the funds to be able to pay for them. And when you look back at that analysis, here's a nice quote. I took from one of the analyses done at the time, the risk governance failures resulted essentially in siloed businesses, individuals making decisions within their own ambit of responsibility, their own personal decisions, which ticked the boxes, which did what they had to do according to the formal rules. But those individuals did not take it upon themselves to actually kind of rise above their, their narrow job and say to themselves, does this make sense as a decision that I should be making? 
And for the most part, of course, the answer is no, it did not. They essentially relied on formal rules and to some degree, external rating agencies validating those formal rules rather than individuals taking personal ownership for their choices. So we need people on the front lines of our organizations making day-to-day -day choices to feel personally accountable for their decisions that they make in order to build resilience into our systems. And the best way of kind of taking that concept seriously is actually to go back to a classic piece of research done by two researchers in Michigan called Carl Weick and Kathleen Sutcliffe. They're professors at Michigan University. And they coined the term high reliability organizations as a category of organizations like, for example, nuclear power plants um, and aircraft carriers, situations where human life is genuinely at risk where the need to make sure that you do not have any loss of life is paramount. And they discover that those sort of organizations have a very different culture, a different way of working than traditional companies in, let's say, the software industry, where you know, we take it as a given that human life is not at risk. And they came up with lots of concepts, which I'm not going to take you through in detail now. Uh, a couple of them, I'm just circling on, on the diagram there, preoccupation with failure and resistance to simplification. What individuals in high reliability organizations do is they obsess about the risk that something might not work. If there's a near miss, if there's a small accident, if there is a lost time injury, they try to understand the root cause analysis of where that problem came from. Because where they know that every time there's a, a small mistake, a small, small risk, then that is usually an indicator of something which could go wrong and create a much bigger risk. So they try to not simplify things. They try to take personal accountability for what goes wrong. And I think that's actually a really useful metaphor for, for the way that we should think about organizations in general. Take, for example, the famous notion of a checklist, which if, if you are a pilot and you're about to embark on a transatlantic flight uh, carrying 400 passengers, you fill in a detailed checklist of all of the things that have to be done before you take off. Now you are an experienced pilot. You've done this hundreds, if not thousands of times before. You know every item on that checklist, but it is supremely reassuring to have that list in front of you, just as a way of codifying all of the accumulated wisdom of yourself and all your fellow pilots about what might go wrong. And of course you ultimately make the decision to take off yourself, but you are relying on a degree of formalization as well. So it's a combination of formalization through the checklist and personalization. I am ultimately taking responsibility for flying this plane. And checklists have now found their way, as the image shows, into, for example, how doctors, surgeons think about surgery before they go into the, in, into the operating theater. And it's again, it's a useful approach in many walks of life. My third principle is the shift from efficiency to reliability. Uh, efficiency is all about taking up buffers, slack resources, keeping your costs as low as they possibly can be. And reliability is about building some layer of redundancy and slack into the system so that it's able to withstand failure. And these things, if you think about it, are to some degree in opposition to each other. The more reliable we make the system, the more costs we tend to build into it. But it's not quite as simple as that, is it? Let me just remind you of the famous notion, which of course many of you in the audience are as familiar with as I am, of lean manufacturing. This came out of Toyota in the 1970s. I can trace it back even earlier, but the 1970s was the era when the Toyota production system was codified and understood for what it is. Uh, Taichi Ono was the guy behind it. And in its heart, the Toyota production system is about building quality into a product by eliminating waste. The notion is that we actually get everybody through that system taking responsibility, squeezing out the inefficiencies of the system. And at the heart of that concept, the, the, the inventory that's sitting in a, in a factory waiting to be used 
is a form of inefficiency because it basically says we, you know, we don't trust the system to work. So we're building these huge buffers at various stages along the way. And so that is now the standard way, of course, of, of building entire supply chains and manufacturing operations. But it does come at a price. And you may well remember those of you living in Europe uh, in 2012 when airspace across Europe was closed for five days because of the Icelandic volcano, Eyjafjallajökull. Um, it turned out that, of course, in that five day period, all sorts of perishable goods, all sorts of very tightly wound supply chains were unable to function. And we're seeing that today now with COVID-19. We are seeing examples where entire um, farms worth of goods, fresh goods, are lying uh, in waste on, 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 in the farms because there is no means of getting them to their markets. And so we do have this slight problem that you know, a lean supply chain, when it's tightly wound, actually doesn't allow for these sort of eventualities which are increasingly commonplace. So we need to build reliability into our systems. We need to use double sourcing, multiple sourcing. We need to use local sourcing. We need to build redundancy in so that when one particular route fails, an alternative one works. And I just want to give you the imagery of, first of all, the internet on the left and the electricity grid on the right. If you think about it, these are examples of you know, man-made systems which are hugely reliable. In, in other words, you know, when some part of that system fails, there's almost always a backup in place. You know, we have seen very, very, certainly in the developed world, we've seen very few instances where the electricity grid fails, where the internet fails. It, I'm not saying it's not susceptible to cyber security risks, but the internet as an integrated set of networks through which bits and bytes can be transferred is hugely resilient. And we can learn a lot from these systems. My final point is around the shift from profitability to meaning. And, and this goes back to the basic feature of human nature, which is on the one hand, we can think of humans as motivated by extrinsic drivers, by, by fear and greed and by financial rewards. We want to do a job, good job, because we earn money from it. The alternative view of human nature is that we're motivated by much more intrinsic drivers, concern for others, safety of the planet, our fellow man or woman, and, and that those intrinsic drivers are actually what motivates us to do our work. And as we look at the, the necessary elements of creating a resilient system, it's clear to me that what we need is a, a view of nature which is more about intrinsic motivation, the things that make us choose to do what we do, that give our life meaning, these are the things that make us resilient. And let me just play out that logic at two levels. Think about corporate objectives. Think about this as now kind of classic way of doing it. Think about the contrast between companies such as ExxonMobil, who manifestly focus on making lots of money for their shareholders whilst doing it according to ethical and moral guidelines. And companies like Tata Group, uh, Tata and Sons, who have a very clear statement of purpose, a higher order purpose. In their case, it's about improving the quality of life for the communities that they serve. And I just make this simple observation that's been told many times before, that the companies on the right, the ones which have a very clear purpose, they typically are resilient over the decades, indeed over the centuries. There's lots of long com long-standing companies, two, three, four hundred years old, which have these higher order objectives. And that clarity as to what they're on the planet for helps to give them resilience. Studies have even shown that on average, they are actually more financially successful in the long term than the companies that have narrow focus on financial results. Let me just play that out at the individual level. If we want our organizations to be resilient, we want the people in them to be personally resilient, able to withstand shocks. What does that take? Does it take optimism? Does it take a recognition or sort of a, a mindset that things can only get better? Well, yes and no. It turns out that we need to have a combination of both optimism, a desire to look at what is possible in the future, 
compounded with a realism about the current state of the world. And this concept of, of a blend between optimism and realism is sometimes called the Stockdale paradox. Jim Collins, the author, coined this term Stockdale paradox after the, the, the uh, former very well decorated US um, general called Jim Stockdale, who was actually in a prisoner of war camp in Vietnam. Uh, and he said the people who survived the prisoner of war camp were the ones who were both optimistic and realistic at the same time. He says, you can't confuse faith that you'll prevail from the discipline to confront the facts. Personal resilience relies on this combination of features. And then the other aspect of personal resilience, which I think is really important, is this ability to find meaning in our, in our work in our lives, because if we don't see that sense of what we're doing this for, there is a risk that we just sort of lose interest and we kind of you know, stop actually showing up to meetings in the current lockdown environment. We stop actually taking our work seriously. And again, to give you a rather extreme example, uh, I want to take you back to, to the famous Austrian psychotherapist, Viktor Frankl, who of course um, wrote this book, Man's Search for Meaning based on his experiences in the Nazi concentration camps in the Second World War, which he obviously survived. And I won't take you through his philosophy. I mean, it's very deep. It's very, very thought provoking. But, you know, he said in order to survive that, that, that arduous period, he had to find a way to, to, to sort of remind himself of, of his basic freedom to choose his attitude in whatever circumstance he finds himself in. Now, obviously, I'm not drawing a, a line between Vietnam and the Second World War and the current period that we're living in. What I am saying, though, is that we can learn from extreme situations to help us become more personally resilient in today's environment. So let me summarize and conclude. I've said essentially three things. I've said, look, today's business world is much more uncertain than previous years and we expect it will be for the foreseeable future. We need to rethink both our strategy, how we make our decisions about the future, and how our operations work, our organizing principles. And I gave you three new tools for strategy around active waiting scenarios and real options. And in terms of organizing, I suggested four alternative principles of organizing, which our organizations need to learn how to embrace and use more effectively. So my sort of suggestion to you is to think in terms of how much you are using these alternative principles already and what steps you need to take to get closer to this alternative. So with that, let me finish. I'm very happy to take your questions. Thank you. Excellent talk uh, and very timely given our current situation. Great to have you, Julian. Oh, we're not getting sound. Julian, you might be muted. Yeah, but it, not on my end, unfortunately. Ah, okay. <laughs> Good. We got you taken care of. Okay, well, thank you very much. Okay, you gotcha. Awesome. Good. Great to have okay. you. Now, that, that was an excellent talk. We're really, really, uh, uh, I like that. It's great talk. To, uh, great fits us amazingly well here. A um, couple of good questions came in. Uh, so let's get started with that. Um, how do you encourage personal resilience within employees? Uh, for example, in a bad situation, as we've got with COVID happens and affects them directly. Is it, what are the types of things we can do to help bolster personal resilience? Yeah, I mean, the first point to make is, is that, of course, we're all living through this and we're all figuring it out as we go. We, this is completely unprecedented for all of us. I lead a team of people, I'm sure you do as well. Um, and a couple of very, very practical things that I've learned are needed is that, you know, we, we, we are locked 10 or 12 hours a day in, in Zoom meetings, uh, and that is unsustainable. And I've started over the last two or three weeks to actually make some gaps in my schedule in order to actually find time to do things other than just just sitting in front of my computer. Um, and then, of course, as a leader of others, you've got to try to actually find the time for those one-to-one -one conversations. It's so easy to do everything in big groups because it's more efficient. 
And what I've discovered, of course, I'm sure many of you have got there as well, is that there is only so much value you can get out of a group of 10 people meeting because you simply can't discuss those personal issues. So, so it's, it just takes that much longer. That It's as simple as that to say that personal resilience is about us as individuals making sure that we don't get send all our time in front of, of our computers, go out running, go out walking, whatever it is, and that us as leaders, we need to make sure to really devote some time to every employee one-on-one -on -one as, as much as possible. Excellent, excellent. Um, you got a good question here. Uh, inherently fragile businesses can offer more competitive prices and customers often don't care about the resilience of their supplier. Yeah. yeah. Is it possible to value business resilience without government regulation insisting on stress tests like limits? So. Yeah, gosh, I mean, you're, the questioner is opening up a fascinating almost level of analysis question there. In other words, as you say, for an individual business, um, being resilient is is involves incurring costs uh, and of course for for many customers they don't they don't really care if that business is resilient or not but for the people running that business they absolutely do care and so my my advice and this may not be quite answering the question but my advice to corporates is increasingly that they should be taking that portfolio view not putting their eggs in one basket as i mentioned with the the kodak uh, case study um and to try to ensure that as one particular revenue stream might dry up, then another revenue stream might grow. But, but of course, that is, that is a corporate view, which is not necessarily completely consistent with, for example, the way that stock markets are often valued companies in the past, or indeed that individual customers or suppliers might treat those businesses. So, so I do think that the answer to that question depends a great deal on you know, where you sit. We're trying to build resilience in for ourselves, which doesn't necessarily mean greater resilience for the system as a whole. Okay, no, excellent, excellent. Uh, great question here. How much is leadership important to real options in that leaders need to be able to re-envision the identity and purpose of the business in order to hold rather than, than discard an option? Was it narrow-minded views of Kodak's identity and purpose that caused them to divest their chemical business? Yeah, and, and as the as I said in the previous answer, you know, Kodak did what was kind of the correct perceived wisdom at the time. It was all about what's your core competence, stick to what you're good at, get rid of everything else, which was the, you know, the logic of the time, which may or may not still be valid today. But to the question about leadership and real options, here's the point I would make. Um, I touched on it in the video, but in the, in the recording, but, but the fact is that every possible initiative or project that you and your company is putting together can be framed as a real option. In other words, anyone who's you know worth their salt can make the case that what they want to do is a platform for future growth. So you've got to try to be explicit about what it is that we are learning from these options, what possible additional resource opportunities arise from that. And then you've got to be extremely good at killing those options as much as creating them. So the more we take a real options approach, the more actually we're putting, you know, back into the hands of the, the, the portfolio managers, the people who are overseeing resource allocation about which experiments have kind of done their time and need to be killed and which ones to put additional money into. And of course that, to answer the question, that is what real leadership is about, is actually having a point of view on how that portfolio is evolving to meet the changing demands. Yeah, excellent, excellent. Um, we got a next, another question here. How critical is diversity of thought in ensuring organizational resilience in today's environment? Look, I mean, you, you know, I'm going to say yes, it's very important. <laughs> diversity of thought, you know, diversity on all dimensions is a huge issue right now with the Black, the Black Lives Matter um, demonstrations around the world. So, so let me just try to be a little bit more helpful in that. I mean, diversity of thought has always been important. It is vitally important that our decision-making processes allow for those alternative points of view to find their way forwards. But of course, the trouble is that that, that does sometimes lead to fragmentation of our decision-making processes at the same time. And so the more diversity of thought we, we allow and encourage, which is a good thing, that the, the better managed our decision processes have to be. In other words, in a world of groupthink, everybody complete, quickly converges, 
and we just move forward presuming things are going to work. The more we bring in these alternative views, the more we've got to be explicit about when we're moving from, for example, you know, the divergent phase of you know, this is a bunch of brainstorming through to the convergent phase of making decisions. And sometimes we need to even separate out the meetings into different stages to make that work. So that's that's the only thing I'll say just to kind of you know build on the point that diversity of thought, of course, is vital in these situations. Uh, excellent. Excellent. Um, here's one that, that uh, I've been been uh, thinking about over the years is the times where you have a, a difference in an individual's risk profile, their personal risk mm -hmm. profile, and, and what the organization's risk profile might be. So for example, you have a, a middle manager who's thinking about, oh, if I make a mistake, my career is gone. Uh, and so they may be overly conservative. And then you have the other example, maybe a financial trader who says, hell, I'm gambling with house money, right? And I'll take as yeah. much risk as possible. Yeah. You know, how do we, how do, and, you know, bureaucracies have sort of been the means of, of dealing with that, but you know, you've got this balancing act to play yeah. How do you deal with uh, look, that economy? It's a, it's a fascinating point. I've, I've absolutely grappled that with that as well. I mean, it is true that the, the, the bigger the organization, the bigger the bureaucracy, the more we um, individuals make choices which are about, shall we say, minimizing the downside rather than maximizing the upside. In other words, they do become very risk averse. Um, and of course, what we're trying to do to get overcome these bureaucratic tendencies is to try to align the, the interests of our conservative or fearful employees a bit more with the, the legitimate risk appetite of a big organization. So, so in those situations, we're absolutely trying to make sure that you know, we're taking fear out of the situation, we're encouraging well-intentioned failure and all that sort of stuff. But you're absolutely right. There are some situations, very few, but they're quite painful situations where you do have these individuals who, who sometimes feel it's, they have the opportunity to, 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 to bet the bank. Um, and of course, we've got to be equally hard on those rogue traders who see it, who see fit to, you know, to challenge the rules and, and break the rules. So, so I guess the, the sort of bring those two points together, you know, we've got to be very good at assessing our current status within the organization in terms of just how much are individuals actually prepared to take risks. And then we have to you know, redesign or, 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 or nudge our control and monitoring systems accordingly. And in most big organizations, that means giving greater appetite for risk for middle managers, but one or two situations, it's the opposite. Okay, no, that's great, great. A, a um, good question on your last point about moving from profitability to meaning. Yeah. And which is what sort of cultural resistance have you seen and suggestions for going around these particular cultural resistance rocks? Um, resistance to moving towards meaning. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Uh, right. Yeah. 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 I mean, look, we know that the huge pressures that listed companies are under to make quarterly returns and to do things, you know, as it were, you know, by the, the sort of those traditional shareholder profit maximization guidelines are. Um, and so as a leader, what we've got to do is clearly create that buffer, if you like, between what, you know, what our quarterly returns expectations are and individuals. And as long as we are smart about doing that, we create that wedge of purpose, then it can kind of flow from that. So, so the, the answer is, is not, is not rocket science. You go to that much cited company Unilever, you know, when Paul Polman was the chief executive, you know, he basically said, we're not going to do quarterly, um, quarterly reporting anymore. You're going to give you an annual set of forecasts and the market sort of sucked that up eventually and accepted it. And another thing Unilever has done quite cleverly is actually pushed purpose and meaning conversations down to individual levels. Individuals have these conversations about the purpose of my individual job. And I think that's a great practice. It's difficult to do. It takes a huge amount of time. But this notion that we should be pre prepared to encourage people to find meaning at all levels is, I think, exactly right. Many of the, the audience, of course, are working in the, the agile area. And of course, a good agile team or squad or whatever you want to call them will always have a clear purpose statement. And that has to be encouraged. And it's only the, the leaders above who actually give them space to, to, to take that meaning-based approach rather than always looking for, for short-term progress. Yeah, 
Yeah, so good. So um, that's a great point. If you can you can bring some element of meaning even in an organization, perhaps like an Exxon that you, you gave an example as one that's really focused on on the money side of it. But even within that type of organization, it's quite possible to create meaning and uh, and build on that. Exactly. And I don't want to suggest for a second that Exxon is only caring about money. You're not saying that. But my guess is I don't know the company well, but my guess is in big chunks of Exxon, there are people who are doing exactly that, that are giving a lot of thoughts to you know, the meaning of their particular activity or business unit. So, yeah. yeah, no, exactly. Um, okay, uh, let's see. Got a good question here. Um, very few professions are trained to cope emotionally with rejection. I guess you did talk about this a little bit. Uh, hence, real option cultures can be emotionally painful to adopt. Um, okay. And do you have any tips for building resilience in the workforce, in the workforce, uh, to enjoy having their ideas killed. So, yeah, I mean, you know, and I touched on it, and, and it's you know, it's it's funny how this has become, you know, uh, these conversations very quickly go back to this this key notion of what's often called psychological safety, right? This notion that you know, if you're a leader of a group of ten people, a group of a hundred people, you know, almost like your your biggest responsibility, if you're to take seriously a lot of these new models of management, is to build a context in which people feel that it's okay to try out their slightly crazy ideas. And I, and I live this on a day-to-day -day basis. So I know how easy it is for me as a senior person to knock down somebody else's idea because I don't think much of it. And I have to work doubly hard to catch myself and to make sure that they get a proper airing and that if I'm going to challenge it, I'm going to try and challenge them in order to try and prove the idea rather than just to dismiss it out of hand. And, you know, there are mechanisms we can use. I've, I've, I've experimented with running, you know, safe, uh, failure shares at the beginning of meetings, getting people, you know, every month someone talks about a project that they did which failed and why it failed and what we le can learn from it just to try to embed that notion that, in fact, failure is part of, of the everyday fabric of what we do in, in innovative organizations. Very good, very good. Uh, it's a good question here. Um, so we, I guess we, we think today of the big tech companies as being, um, you know, they have disrupted uh, a lot of other organizations. Do you think that they are the most resilient organizations today and into the future? Or are they, are they going to be suffering their own disruptions? Yeah. Yeah, it's a great question. And obviously the, the smaller tech companies are not resilient. I mean, you know, the Ubers and Airbnbs are still losing money. But when we're talking about the, you know, the big Googles and Facebooks and Microsofts, you know, they have such huge resources right now um, that they are, are indeed hugely resilient. Um, but, uh, you know, you should never say never, right? I mean, 20 years ago, we were trying to break up Microsoft as a monopolist. Uh, and then of course that, that case went away. We used to talk about Cisco and Nokia and, and the list goes on. So, so for, you know, for the rest of my business life, you know, another 10 years, let's say, I can absolutely see those big five companies, those big American companies, a couple of Chinese ones, continuing to, to ride these storms. But we, we know that eventually, you know, the world will move on and something will come along to replace them. But I, I wouldn't want to put any bets on exactly when that will happen. All right. Well, very good. I think we have um, hit the end of our Q&A time. Really appreciate it. This was a fantastic okay. talk. Really, um, some insights that we're definitely, we are dealing with in our community. And I think the entire world is dealing with the challenges. So uh, thank you for your, your insights. It's been fantastic. Thanks, Tom. It's a great pleasure. Thanks a lot. Thank Cheers. Thanks. Cheers.